that um, it's really cool when you get introduced by a United States Senator, and it's really, really cool when he's your United States Senator, and he's definitely mine. Thank you, honey. Um, I say this to share it privately a lot, but I've been saying it more publicly, more often publicly just recently because um, I know so many of you have known Sherrod much longer than I. And so many of you have told me privately that you consider him to be one of your heroes. And um, what I tell Sherrod often is I want him to understand he's one of my heroes. And I mean that, and a lot of you know I'm a journalist and we don't have a lot of those. <laughs> we, we tend to be a more cynical group, but I'm really proud of Sherrod. Um, and I'm really honored to share the stage with him and so many honorable people today. I don't know how many of you had a chance to uh, see any of their Republican convention, but we watched a, a good part of it. So I want to start by talking about why I'm a liberal. Um, I am a liberal out of gratitude. And I feel that there, really when you think of even just the personal narrative of my life, which is like so many lives in this country, I really don't have any choice but to be a liberal. I'm a liberal because, first and foremost, of my father's union job. He was a member of the utility workers, Local 270. And he worked at the Cleveland Electric Illuminating Plant on the shore of Lake Erie for 36 years. And I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a moment. But my father's union job, with his union wages and his union health care, made sure that I stayed alive after I was diagnosed with very serious asthma, rushed by ambulance several times in my teenage years, almost died twice. But we had the kind of health care in that union contract that made it possible for me to get life-saving treatment at the Cleveland Clinic when I was still a teenager. And because of my father's union wages and my mother's, my mother's hourly wages as a non-union worker, at Ashtabula General Hospital as a nurse's aide, my parents were able to send me to college. I was the first in my family to go. And because of federal loans, low interest student loans and grants, I was able to graduate from Kent State University with less than $2,000 in debt and to be the first in my family to go to college. And because of the feminist movement, my column is in op-ed pages in newspapers around the country instead of in the so-called woman section. How could I not be a liberal? I really was, um, I can't say I was amused by it because the more I watched it, the more irritated I got as one Republican after another took the stage at the National Convention and wanted to talk about his or her working class roots. We're very trendy, you know, every four years. Every four years, it's sudden, very, suddenly very cool to come from the working class. Yeah. And the thing is, they, I couldn't help but notice how far back so many of the Republican people, the speakers have to go, including candidates around the country, when they want to talk about their working class roots. If your grandfather worked in a mine, but your parents were lawyers or doctors or teachers or all kinds of professions, you don't have working class roots. You had advantages and privileges that your grandparents worked so hard to make possible for your parents. And you don't have working class roots. Well, let's put it this way. You're doing one of two things. You're either lying about your working class roots, or worse, you've betrayed the people you come from. If you are a Republican and you do things like this, if you oppose the auto the rescue that saved tens of thousands of American jobs, you are not a champion of the working class. If you don't stand up to China, you are not a champion of American workers. If you don't care about the millions of Americans who had no health care before the Affordable Care Act passed, if you keep talking about how you're going to repeal the Affordable Care Act, you are not a champion of the working class. And if you don't care about workers, including public union workers in the state of Ohio, if you oppose workers and you want to break the union, you are not a champion of the working class. I want to tell you just a little bit about my mom and dad, because, uh, well, it's Labor Day. And uh, in our house, you knew who had the union job and who didn't because dad didn't have to work on Labor Day, and if he did, he got time and a half. But mom worked almost every Labor Day. 
because she was a non-union worker, a nurse's aide at Ashtabula General Hospital. My mom was four feet 11, her name was Janie. I, it, it did my heart such good, Mr. Curry, when you told me you worked with my mom at the hospital because you were in the emergency room there working. Um, her name was Janie, and uh, in the last couple years of her life, she was a hospice home care worker. I don't need to tell you how, what that kind of work looks like. She loved her job. The joke about my mom was when Janie showed up, people lived longer. She was one of those women who took care of people day in and day out. She would be with the same person all day long, day in and day out. She'd sit with them and listen to their stories and go through their family albums and cook their favorite recipes and do whatever they needed to find the peace they were hoping to find before they died. My mom died 13 years ago this month. She was 62 years old. She died of a lung disease and had never smoked a day in her life. And we've always believed that um, she probably died of, of the pulmonary fibrosis from exposure to asbestos, which was often on my dad's clothes and on his car when he would drive home from work. My dad was named Chuck Schultz. And my dad was six foot two in his prime, 240 pounds. He was a big guy. And he was often an angry guy. And I really didn't understand why until I visited the plant where he used to work about five years, about two years ago, and I wrote about it for Parade Magazine. And it was abandoned. It was like a ghost town. And you could still see boots sitting there in the ash. You saw raincoats and I mean, whatever they were called. I mean, they were obviously fire gear. And I have a 12 pound wrench on my coffee table now that my dad used to hold on the job. And it helped me understand his muscles and being in that dark, dirty place helped me understand his rage. I often tell the story about my dad. When I was a sophomore in high school, I was playing catch out in the front yard with my brother. This was our routine. I'm sure it sounds very familiar to a lot of families here. My dad was one of those guys who showered after work. So he'd come home from the plant, you know, his red hair would be shiny with the brill cream. He had just, it looked like you could see the rose where he just combed it. He had just gotten out of the shower. And his, his ritual in the warm months in Ashtabula is he'd drink a can of Strohs or Rolling Rock, whatever was on sale, and sit on the front stoop and watch my little brother and I play catch with the softball while mom made supper. And I, all these years later, I still remember this moment when I was playing catch with my brother Chucky and my dad started to shake his head. And I thought I had thrown the ball wrong. And I said to my dad, what is it, dad? And he didn't even look at us. He said, you could teach a monkey to do what I do. My dad thought he was a nobody. My mother thought she was a nobody. But they were going to raise four somebodies. And all four of us went to college. My dad died at age 69 in the middle of Sherrod's 2006 Senate race. My parents wore their bodies out so that their children would never have to. My dad carried a lunch pail every day to work. My dad worked with that 12 pound wrench. The hardest piece of equipment, the heaviest piece of equipment I've ever had to carry is my laptop. I am a liberal out of gratitude. I want to thank all of you for coming on this windy, cloudy day on Labor Day. I mean, we know why we're here. We're here to honor workers. We're here to honor the tradition of the labor movement that made this holiday possible. I don't want to leave the stage before I tell you one quick story about the guy I'm married to. It has nothing to do with politics, but it has everything to do with who he is. Sherrod's mom, Emily Campbell Brown, was born in Mansfield, Georgia, and moved to Mansfield, Ohio when she married Sherrod's father, and she raised three boys in Mansfield. She was dying in the last weeks of 2008, and she had been so low, she registered 1,400 people to vote, almost 1,400, by setting up a card table outside one of the neighborhoods that was getting neglected in Mansfield, because we all know how that works. We're seeing it at play right now in the state of Ohio. We know who they want to register to vote. We know who they want to keep from voting. She was determined that everyone got a chance to vote and she would take that card table, 88 years old, 89 years old, and putting up that card table registering people to vote. In the last weeks of her life, we took care of her. She was determined that she was gonna see Barack Obama sworn in as the first African-American president of the United States, and by golly, she did. She was in that hospice bed in her living room, watching it on the TV set with Sherrod's brother Bob sitting next to her while we went to Washington, which she insisted on. 
In the last weeks of her life, all three of the boys and their wives helped with Emily's care. And I will never forget this moment, sitting at the dining room table within clear view of the hospital bed as Sherrod was standing by his mother. And she looked up at Sherrod in that wonderful southern voice, started to talk, and she said, Sherrod, I would love to hear a song from the Lutheran hymn hymnal. And Sherrod, ever the dutiful youngest boy, walked into the family library, took out the Lutheran hymnal, and came out and sang, what was the song? Beautiful Savior. Three verses of Beautiful Savior. Now you all have heard how Sherrod talks. He talks like this. He sings like this too. And so I was watching as he was standing over his mother's bed and singing three verses of Beautiful Savior. It was very touching. It was very sweet. And it, I admit it made me cry. Well, the next morning, she looked at Sherrod and she said, Sherrod, I wish our friend Janine were here. Now, some of you know Janine. She's one of the most fabulous singers ever, and she was a dear friend of our family. And Sherrod said, well, why do you want Janine here, Mom? And he said, well, I would just love to have her sing from the Lutheran hymnal. And Sherrod looked at her and said, well, well Mother, I just sang three verses of Beautiful Savior to you yesterday, remember? And she said, I know, honey, you're better in a group. <laughs> Teaching to the very end. But the message is clear, is it not? We are all better in a group. And that's why we are together here today. That's why we will work very hard for the causes we believe in, for the men and women we know represent the best that America has to offer. Thank you so much. You've been such a generous audience.